Hola guapas, and welcome to episode five of the Hola Guapa podcast. I'm your host, Nisha Batesh, the founder of Hola Guapa, which is now a blog, online shop, and community of almost 10,000 female creatives from all over the world. Before we get into the show, I wanted to take a quick minute to share some major updates and announcements taking place at the Guapa shop this week. So if you've been following along on Instagram, then you already know it's official. The entire Ola Guapa Party Dingle collection is now live on daisyla.com. New to Daisy LA? Allow me to introduce you to this insanely cool shop founded by fellow female artist and designer, Danny. Danny is a huge supporter of ethically sourced and produced female owned and artist inspired baby businesses. It has been my dream to be a part of her mission and movement since the day I discovered her years ago. Featured in Marie Claire, Nylon, and Forbes, just to name a few, Daisy LA leads by example, setting the tone and model for how the Guapa shop and I hope many others choose to operate by supporting female artists first. With this said, I'm thrilled to announce that the Guapa shop is following in Daisy LA's footsteps and is now on the hunt for new designers and makers to add to our shop. If this is something that excites you, feel free to DM me on Instagram at olaguapa or get in touch by email nisha at olaguapa.com. This maker series has been a huge goal of mine and will launch at the beginning of October, just in time for you to shop from a variety of your favorite Guapa artists this holiday season. And without further ado, let's welcome Sarah to the podcast. Sarah Schroeder is an OG Ola Guapa artist, abstract painter, mom, wife, and teacher. With almost 50,000 loyal fans on Instagram, Sarah is someone we can all learn from and look up to. Learning more about her creative journey was so inspirational to me as we touched on topics like burnout, developing your personal brand, and how to adapt quickly and positively to whatever your creative journey has in store for you. What I loved most about sitting down with Sarah to record this podcast was her ability to be so gentle, patient, and kind with herself. As a fellow artist who also has a full-time job as well as dreams of one day being a mom and wife, I so admire her willingness to pivot, embrace plot twists, and choose the untraditional route on her journey to success. For a huge part of her life, Sarah took a pause from working on her art. Now a full-time artist and extremely successful in her own right, she is an advocate and champion for creative devotion, encouraging women all over the world to practice their craft every single day. So without wasting any more time, let's welcome Sarah to the show. Um, so my name is Sarah Schroeder. I am originally from uh, the Northwest part of the US, like Idaho, Washington area. Um, and I live in Miami now, and I've been here uh, in this area for almost 20 years. <laughs> so almost equal uh, splitting my time now in my life from 20 years out there and 20 years down here. Um, I have four kids and I am an artist, an abstract artist, and I split my time pretty equally between being a stay-at-home mom and doing my artwork. Um, I probably spend, because my kids are older, a little more time on my artwork now than I did in the past, so leaning more towards full-time artwork now. Amazing. Um, so let's take it even further back. So when was the moment when you first realized that you were um, inspired to start creating or that you knew that you were sort of set on this like creative path? Um, well, I, that's hard to say because honestly, I just remember always drawing and making things growing up. My, my mom was an artist, so she had that influence on me, um, but I just always loved um, drawing and making things um, my parents were very crafty. <laughs> my dad's like a big, uh, he's super handy and fixes things and builds things. And my mom being the artist was painting things all the time and they like to do things themselves and make things themselves. So even our Christmases were a little bit different. Like my dad was really anti, um, uh, commercialism. So <laughs> we had to only make our Christmas presents. So I think that probably had a big influence on me being a crafter when I was younger. For sure. Um, but I'm an introvert too. So I used to love drawing. I just like the quiet time and the, you know, being in my head and imagining things. Um, and when I went away to college, well, a little bit backtrack again, I took every art class imaginable in my public schooling, you know, like middle school, every elective I could possibly take in high school too. Um, but then going to college, I kind of felt like 
it wasn't a real career <laughs> and didn't really have um, maybe a, a solid money earning potential to it. I didn't really know what I was going to do. So I went and I started majoring in something else and found myself every day coming home and drawing instead of wanting to work on my actual classes. So at the end of that year, I decided to change my major to fine art, which I did. Um, and then I did about a year and a half of that. And then I did not finish my degree in fine art. So I'm kind of like this hybrid between self-taught and classically trained. Um, but I would say that moment in college where I was kind of dissatisfied with the major I'd chosen and then What major did you choose? Um, it was called social welfare. And I always, it's like a, I have a hard time even saying that in my mouth, all the L's or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, there were a lot of government classes. It was on a lot on government policy. And I, that's not what I had imagined it being. I thought I've, my, in my head, a social worker was going to be like in the mix of things with kids. I particularly thought I had kind of like this vision in my head of how I was going to be able to walk into people's lives and be some sort of helpful source. And what I was going through in school was not that part of it. That doesn't mean it never would have gotten there, but I just remember being so burned out at the end of the day that I was like, oh, this is not, I don't think this is for me. Yeah, I think that that happens to a lot of people. So you ended up making the switch to being a fine art major, but then you didn't graduate. Can you tell us about that? Um, well, I, had my son. <laughs> I just opted okay. to stay home. Yeah. And then I did do a little bit of schooling after he was born, but I was just so happy being a mom. And I never really felt like, I think some people have this drive and really feel like it's important to get a degree. And I didn't feel that way. And I still don't feel that way. A little, every once in a while, I feel a little bit embarrassed to be like, oh, I don't have my degree. But then the majority of myself, I don't feel that way because I, even if I had the choice to go back, my God, I don't think I wouldn't go back. I just, it wasn't my thing. I mean, I think that it's like something that so many creatives go through, whether or not to go through formal education or not. And I know that that's something that, you know, you often talk about is you're super big on teaching and guiding and education. And I think that you find your means of doing that through your art. Right. I know that you recently, um, when you first launched your website, you put out a video sort of talking about like a guide about using art as an alphabet. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that you sort of wanted to share on social, um, you know, to give back to your followers. You have a huge following on social. Um, can you talk to us about like how you sort of made that transition from doing it as more of a hobby and a passion to switching it into more of a full-time career and business and then how you started to give back to your community as well? Um, well, I think it all came very organically. I don't, I, I didn't really have this, this clear map in my head when I started out. And I feel like I, I that's kind of how I live my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got like, a theme going, but it's in. working for you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, when I, when I started, I, I took a huge break from art. And then when I it was like these little breadcrumbs kind of led to me doing it again as my kids got older, as we got a new house and I had room again to do it. Um, and then I just decided, it, really not that long ago, it was, I think it was 2018, when I, January of 2018, where I was like, you know what, I really, I'm loving this again. It's something has kind of lit up inside me again. I'm going to just start doing it and I'll, I'm going to treat it like it's my part-time job and I'm just going to go for it. And see, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. I just mm -hmm. was like, I'm going to make art every day. I'm going to set, give myself hours like I'm going to work and I'm just going to start making stuff and I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> that was my business plan, <laughs> which wasn't, wasn't fantastic. But then everything has kind of grown organically from that. Like I did not make the leap to be teaching um, purposefully. That wasn't something I set out to do. That kind of came to me. And I, I feel like that's how everything has kind of happened to me so far. Um, and I know, you know, people will ask on Instagram in particular, you know, do you have any classes or do you you have any, you know, tutorials or every once in a while, I'll put a little, um, uh, like a hyperlapse or something of when I'm doing a piece of artwork and, 
I mean, everybody seems to really love it. And then people will ask what, why I did this and why I did that. So it, the teaching part kind of comes naturally. And I think so many of the people who follow my artwork are on their own artistic journey and wanting to learn more. So it's just natural to ask questions. Um, so I, the, the teaching part, and I actually don't know if I will step into a teaching role regularly or if that's just something that's going to be very, more sporadic. I, I did teach a class for a different art program and it was, you know, she said it was for, um, for Kelly Wynn Conrad. She does the True Art, True Colors Art program. And she said, can you do maybe like a half hour, just a really quick little thing. And I, I don't know what happened to me, but I got so into it and methodical about, which is not typically the way I function to be very methodical, but I was like, oh, well, if I do, I kind of had this thing in my head where I was going to take people through this whole process of how to use their journal. And it ended up being this seven part class or something, seven 20 minute classes. And she was like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that. That's not, you didn't have to do all that. So that was fun. And I really loved the way that class, the outcome of that one, but it was a lot of work. And what I found was that while I did love the outcome and I loved the process of making it, the, the editing and everything is really hard and it takes so much time. And I think if I'm going to do that as a permanent part of my career, it's going to have to be more when I have hired help. <laughs> I think I'm happy doing like the, on my website with a quick little thing I did about the, um, the visual vocabulary. That to me is a very quick exercise. And I think a little bit of what I want to really champion with people who follow me and my artwork is that it doesn't have to be something that takes a long time every day but if you really want to be an artist that you really need to devote some time every day and to me doing that practice of developing the vocabulary and your little practices that can you that can you explain that for like um anybody out there who doesn't know what you're talking about when you talk about the visual vocabulary um so really it's i think a lot of artists talk about it but it's just observing your life and the things around you and really starting to pay attention to different patterns that you might see or marks that you might see um and and making a visual note of that um so there's that on kind of the surface level and that helps you make a collection of your own marks that become the the vocabulary that you use in your own artwork. So then eventually you'll end up using these things so much that when somebody looks at your piece of artwork, it's distinctly you. They know, oh, that's, you know, Nisha's or Sarah's or whatever. Um, but there's also a different kind, which I think is harder to achieve, but I think it's a, maybe a little bit more meaningful too. Like if you're um, journaling or doing a meditation or you're just really immersed in some kind of emotion. If you take a minute and close your eyes and sort of pay attention to what you can see, maybe there's a color or maybe there's, you know, maybe all you see is all this, you know, like gray chaos or something and you can make a note of that and save that, then that gives you a vocabulary, like a visual piece of vocabulary for that particular emotion that you can then bring into your artwork later. So that's, I don't know. Does that explain it okay? Yeah, totally. That's such a cool takeaway. I mean, thinking about using sort of like markings to almost in a way, I think like what we're all doing is branding ourselves and branding ourselves as artists. And I think like this method of mark making or like visual vocabulary is such a cool idea. Mm -hmm. It's useful too, especially if you're at a loss for something to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, there was, you were talking about something before I, I asked you to explain this. You were on a good path. <laughs> <laughs> um, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. Um, oh, I think maybe the practice of making art every day. Yes. Is that one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I just, I think that's important. And I think to me, it feels very important because for so many years I didn't make art and I, because I was a busy mom and I, I had a lot of stuff going on and I, I felt like I needed more space. And every once in a while I would, 
I would get out all of my supplies and I used to paint and oil and I, you know, and it hindered me a bit, I think, because it would take over our entire dining room and the table and there was stuff everywhere and we couldn't eat or the kids couldn't do homework or, you know, it felt very intrusive on our lives. Um, and then when I started making art again, and I think it was 2015, I just started very small. I was making little, I just decided to start doodling again and I made little note cards and it just kind of started growing from there. And, and I just think it changed my emotional state to be making art every day. And I, I think I wish I would have been doing it all along. And it doesn't take long. I can tell even now, you know, if I get in a, into a phase, like I did just launch my website and it took so much behind the scenes work and I wasn't really making artwork and I was cranky. Like I could feel, I could feel all this just chaos and grossness <laughs> building up inside me. Totally. And I, I just, I would tell my husband, I was like, I just have to go. I need like 10 minutes. Just, I need to just, you know, watercolor in particular. I love watching it just like spread over the paper kind of flowing. Um, and just doing that, it makes me calm down and makes me feel like I'm letting out some of that chaos. I've heard that like a few times, um, you know, in my previous conversations that, you know, art is like such a form of therapy. It's almost like, it's not like as much a calling to sort of pursue this business as it is to like truly like in the rawest sense of the way, like express yourself. Yeah. And I know it's interesting, like you've talked a few times about having like a physical art space and that's something that like I'm challenged by too. I see people like creating, you know, sometimes on these tiny desks and, you know, there's mood boards everywhere and art or, and supplies everywhere and they're all perfectly organized. And I'm so inspired by that. But at the same time, like I need space. And I feel yeah. like what you're saying is sort of the same thing that that really like lends to your practice as well as being able to spread out and have right. your supplies out and open and kind of have this sort of like messy exchange with like the physical space that you're creating in. Right. I do enjoy that now. And I, and I would never trade it. What I, what I do wish that I would have like in, in your phase right now, I don't, are you in an apartment or where you're trying to, it has to stay contained? <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, I've definitely had my experience of like being in an apartment with the roommate and like her maybe having plans for the night and being like, okay, I can spread everything out and like get creative. And then she comes home at one or two in the morning and I'm like, shoot, I got to put it all away. Oh, like, you know, time flies. So, yeah, so I yeah. definitely had that experience. But um, right now, just in quarantine, I've converted the, um, my little brother's old bedroom in my parents' house. Oh, nice. So, so yeah, like no matter what it takes, like I always have to find space. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that does help. I mean, that definitely helps me live the lifestyle of an artist right now. Um, if I could go back and pat my, you know, 20 something year old self with two little kids running around on the back and tell me how to make myself happy, I would probably say just give yourself a little shoebox of supplies and a little journal and sit down and doodle every day for 20 minutes or something, you know? So yes and no, yes, you need the space, but no, also it can help you even if you're doing just this little thing with a small amount of supplies. Yeah. That's a good point too. Cause you talked about getting away from it for so long. And I think that that happens like to a lot of creatives as well as like, no matter what, if it's having kids or, you know, doing a career switch or yes, like we're artists, but we also have lives and sometimes like lives can overtake that. And can you talk about that, that period for a little bit of when you weren't creating? Um, as far as what was going on or? <laughs> yeah. What stopped yeah. you from creating? So I know you say that you have kids. Oh. Is it just, did life just get hectic? Yeah. I mean, I, so we have four kids and, um, I, for a while, they're all four years apart, which is great in some ways and in, in other ways makes life really tricky because at one point I had a high schooler and a newborn infant and two in between. So I was nursing a baby and then, you know, getting my kid to high school and then trying to do homework with a kindergartner. And, you know, there's also one in, you know, fifth or sixth grade at the time doing their thing. So that was confusing and hard and just a lot going on and not really, you know, when you have a baby at home, there's, there's not five or six hours in the day with nobody home. Um, and then nap time 
you know, I, I think back on that part of my life, I think what I really needed during that time more was some human interaction. And I would just spend hours on the phone with my friend. And that was just the thing that kind of kept me going at that time. Um, and I, I think back on it now and we would complain about, cause she's very creative too. And we would complain about, we don't have any time to make anything yet. We're sitting here on the telephone. That's but we so could, funny. <laughs> we could talk on the phone and full clothes or do dishes or whatever. So, um, I think it was just that, I think just the daily everything. And my husband at the time, um, he was in medical school and then he was a resident and then he was a fellow. So it, you know, a lot of my time was just me with the kids. So I, I guess I didn't feel like there was a lot of time for me to just do this pursuit of my own. Um, yeah, you know, like the reason why I ask is because I'm sure that there's a lot of um, artists out there who are maybe like getting ready to embark on motherhood or are running ar around trying to, you know, manage the same thing. And I think like sharing sort of your story or, you know, looking back how you say like you're folding clothes on the phone with your friend, but you, you could have been doodling at that time too. Yeah. It's interesting. And then, you know, at the same time, I think that you talk a lot about like consistency really being um, something that you said that you champion. And I think, um, you know, maybe that experience lent itself to you believing so hard now to practice every day. Like maybe that's sort of what led to that, like practice and that gratitude for being able to practice your work every day. I do think, yeah, I think that's right. And I, I do think there were other things that happened in, during that time too. Um, money was tight for us. And I, there were, there were a few times where I was like, okay, let me just paint something real quick and see if I can sell it. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. You can't. Yeah, you don't, right. You don't have an audience and you don't have anybody that follows your work. Like who's going to buy your artwork if nobody's there to see it? So that, that wasn't a great plan um, in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you have a huge following. And I think, you know, talking about like sort of that transition, you said that it happened so organically, but it's like, did, was there something that you did along the way that, you know, sort of tipped the scales there or... Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I, I can say, I know I can say when it started. When okay. I, So in 2018, I listened to a podcast by um, Andy Miller, Andy okay. J. Pizza the, from Creative Pep Talk. Um, and he had just said during one of his podcasts, just see if you can double your, your current following. And I was like, oh, that's okay. I have 250 followers. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about for the year. I'm like, okay, that's low pressure. I can definitely do that. <laughs> So, um, I just was like, I'm going to every day, I'm going to do something and I'm going to put it out there and I'll see what happens. And then I did participate in a couple different, um, like I did, um, I always call it the wrong thing. It's the 100 day project. Is that right? Uh -huh. I yeah. The that. challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did that and that definitely pushed, pushed me into this whole new realm because it caught on for whatever reason, the artwork that I was making those hundred days really appealed to people and it got shared a lot and a lot of people started following me during that time. So the, um, the idea is that you create a piece of artwork no matter what every single day for a hundred days in a row and you post it every day. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay. You don't necessarily have to do it that way, but yes, that's what I did. Okay. And I just kept my artwork very small. I did these little six, six inch by eight inch watercolor pieces that were really very easy for me to make, but really let me explore different ways of using the paint and different marks and different materials. And um, so it was a lot of fun for me, but I could do it in less than 20 minutes. And if I had more time than that, I could do five or six in a day and I would just save them to post the days I didn't have time to make something. But um, yeah, that definitely was a booster for me and for my following. Um, and then I did, and I, I spoke about this um, just recently with somebody. I did a couple different fundraisers because I think when you're um, when you're starting out, it's very intimidating to ask people to buy your artwork because you are still in that stage of feeling like it's not good enough, or maybe you don't deserve money for your artwork, or you don't deserve as much money as you think you want to ask for. So it was it was m much easier for me to get my feet wet by doing a fundraiser. And I, I didn't even ask for any money. I didn't even ask for any money for shipping. <laughs> I just did the fundraiser and I said, you know, this piece of artwork is available for a donation of $20 to this charity. Just donate to the charity directly and send me a screenshot of your payment receipt. And then I'll send you the piece of artwork. 
And I did that, I think, for 30 days. And I, I think that helped also. Um, and when I think about kind of the, the, dif the different things I did, I, it's definitely important when you're trying to grow your following, I think, to participate in the different challenges and in these different groups and these different communities. Um, because even before I decided to um, kind of jump into this and see what happened when I was back in the days when I was doodling, I was doing these little note cards and I somehow I stumbled across that. Um, it's I think it's called right on like hashtag right on like W R I T E on and it's kind of like a snail mail like, you know, kind of getting back into sending notes and letters and stuff. So I wanted to practice my lettering at the time. And I remembered hearing Lisa Congdon talk about how she wanted to get better at her lettering. So she lettered something different every day. And so I just told people, I, I mean, I swear I probably had like 130 followers. <laughs> I don't know, but I just said, you know, if anybody wants a quote lettered, I'll send me the quote and I will letter a little note card for you and I'll send it to you. And I did that for, I think the 30 days of the write on challenge. So I think there's, the portion of giving back to the community that you're participating in, um, but also getting the practice regularly. And that combination of giving and practicing is kind of a, a magic formula for just progressing. Yeah, sounds like it. I mean, all of these things that you did so consistently. So you said you started, okay, like maybe with 130 and then it grew to 250 and then your goal was to double it. Did you end up doubling it after the 100 days or like how were you using certain hashtags or like how slowly was this starting to unfold all of this sort of like momentum? Um, well, when I, in January 2018, it was 250. And then I think I, you know, I didn't start marking it down soon enough because it, it finally dawned on me one day that I should mark down my landmarks. Um, I think it grew 10,000 that year. Wow. When I was doing it consistently. Wow. And then, and yeah, there are different hashtags and then a couple, you know, a couple pieces of my artwork got shared on different platforms and that's always helpful. Um, yeah, and then just different opportunities, being able to be in front of different groups of people doing different things, um, different interviews uh, that came about. I had a couple galleries approach me uh, about having some of my work, but honestly, the galleries are not the ones that are, they're not particularly helping me right now. <laughs> can you, I mean, not, not can you talk <laughs> No, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, can you sort of expand on that? Because I think that that is like such a tr traditional way of thinking, you know, like you go to school, you get a formal education, you, you create this body of work, and then your goal is to eventually have it in a gallery. So, you know, from somebody who, and then, but now we're just sort of in this age of like social media and you're able right. to access people so much more organically and like intimately. So can you sort of like talk about somebody who's experienced both? Um, well, I actually, this is a good time to be talking to me about it because I did kind of go through this phase of, do I want to be involved with galleries? Do I not want to be in involved with galleries? I've heard arguments from both sides. I'm not really sure how I feel about it. Um, I like the idea of being accessible to people without a middleman and of not being, not having to be um, admitted by the gatekeeper of the gallery, you know? Mm -hmm. that I like that people can see what they see and like what they like and purchase directly from the artist without, you know, if it's real art or if I have the right training or not. I do like that a lot. Um, and I like being able to talk to my clients and having the relationships with them. And I like that they can see on social media kind of what I'm doing behind the scenes. Um, the, the benefit, so the galleries almost without question will take a percentage of what you make on the artwork from 30 to 50 percent of the piece when it sells which is not bad if they're actively promoting your work and they're you can see that they're also trying to sell your work but i felt a little bit more like i'm doing my all my own promoting um and I don't feel like there's a lot of benefit from it right now, but, but that might just be my experience at the moment. What I have after doing my website um, and 
try, I'm trying to really expand beyond Instagram because while it's a, a fantastic tool and that's how I've built my entire business really is through Instagram. If anything ever happens to it, or if something happens funky with the algorithm or something happens to my account, I don't, I don't really know what would happen to my career. Um, so I'm just trying to spread out kind of over the internet with different things. Like I still have a little bit on Etsy, although I'm kind of moving away for that from that, I just established my website. So I'm really trying to build that and I'm trying to get people to connect with that because I have control over that. Um, and then I'm trying to kind of dabble in society six, maybe, and then, you know, just spread out a little bit more. I'd like to get involved with some online galleries that are specifically fine art galleries. Um, so I see benefits of dealing with the galleries, especially ones who are actively doing the work. Like I, I would, I would much rather do work to promote myself, but then also see the gallery working with me and also promoting my work. You know, I don't want to feel like what I'm doing all this work and getting myself out there. And then you're just selling my work when somebody comes looking for it and then you take the money that I don't like that, <laughs> but, but I do see the benefit in galleries who really do do the work and they also have the ability to keep the value of your work high. So my, you know, I was talking a lot to my husband about this cause I was like, I, I don't enjoy the behind the scenes. I don't enjoy all the, um, all of the administrative stuff and the, it just to me is very draining. And that would be the benefit of having a gallery that carried my work consistently and really that I had a good relationship with. Um, because then I would just be making my work and, 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 you know, providing them what they need. And then they would be doing along with me, all that promotional stuff, but they would, they would be almost like, I, I mean, and maybe I'm talking, you know, without much knowledge here because I don't have a, a gallery that's dealing only, you know, like, the galleries I'm with have several, like lots of different artists. So um, I'm kind of, this might be one of those things in my head that I'm imagining when, when a gallery doesn't have quite so many artists to work for and with that they are a little bit more devoted and, and concerned with being able to promote your work. But um, my hope is that I could find a gallery that would do that and then do, they would be taking care of most of the administrative stuff and I would be able to do most of my work just and have that be my focus. Yeah, do you feel like you get like a, a certain level of like prestige from, from being in a gallery as well? Like, do you feel like it elevates, like you mentioned the value of your work? Are you able to charge more by being in a gallery or how, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I think for sure. I think for sure that helps increase the value and, and yeah, it's more esteemed, all of those things, I think, yes. Do you find like press comes to you more from being in a gallery or would you say you've, you've sort of, um, you know, connected with more people through social media? I think for me personally, I have connected with more people through social media. Yeah. It's interesting because I, you know, you were talking about like, you don't like doing all the admin work, which I, I feel like probably most creatives don't, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, you know, you have to do it. And I think it's interesting, like talking about, you know, you had to actually stop creating to build your website so that you could sort of build that next stepping block for people to come right. back to. So you're in control. So there right. is a lot of back and forth with that, you know, mm -hmm. balancing the admin and what's going on behind the scenes versus actually just be, being able to set yourself up to create. Right. Well, and I don't know, I don't know when that actually happens. It might be back and forth forever. You know, I might have this fantasy in my head of what it might be like to work with a fantastic gallery. And then I get, I get there and I'm like, well, wait, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. So I, I don't know. I feel like I'm learning all the time about different situations. So I'm just figuring I'll, I'll take it as it comes and cross that bridge when I get there. Yep. That's such a common theme is like just putting one foot in front of the other. And like, if you would actually have known what you would have to do to get to this point, you probably wouldn't have done it. So it's, yes. you know, it's really just like, keep going, just keep swimming. Right. And stay consistent is sort of, you know, what your mantras have been. Right. Awesome. And are you selling a lot of um, your work through Instagram directly then? You said like now you've put together your website, so you're hoping to, you know, transition people over there. Have you, find th have you found out that that's been a struggle or is it an easy transition to have people buy through your Instagram versus having them buy on your website? 
Um, I'm not, I, the jury is still out really. Um, I did, I did sell directly on Instagram and I still do occasionally. Um, people will ask sometimes, is this one for sale? And either it is or it isn't, but if it is, I'll just do the sale directly through Instagram. Um, and then I was doing a lot on Etsy. Um, and, and I think that worked, that worked well because I could promote it on Instagram. And then it, when it launched, it would be on Etsy and people would go to Etsy and just do the purchasing there. Um, with my website, this last launch was very quiet. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like a typical one where I've been able to sell, you know, like 50% of my artwork. And I think it was because it was so with, with all the chaos of the last few months and everybody feeling so out of sorts, I kind of, I had pretty, um, I wouldn't say low expectations, but I think reasonable expectations that it wasn't going to be the same as usual, which was kind of nice for the website just because I didn't know if there were going to be bugs. I didn't know how everything was going to work. I didn't yeah. know, you know, I tried to set up this special shipping system and I didn't know if that was going to work. And I kind of was panicked, like, well, what if, what if, you know, 50 orders come in and I don't know, you know, something goes wrong and I have to go and, you know, try to correct 50 different things. So it was actually nice that it kind of trickled in um, when it launched. And it was just, I think it was just like last week that it launched. Um, but oh, I kind of lost track of what you're saying. Oh, Instagram or the website. I think what is probably going to be the case is that I will promote it and then just have it on my website, just like I've been doing with Etsy. And I think it will be fine. Um, one of the things that works really well on Instagram is if I'm like every, I say every February for the last two Februarys, I've done a little, um, a little special where the artwork I do is $10 off for 10 days or something like, you know, every piece every day is $10 off. So it's something kind of fun and, and people get excited about it. And it, it's always fun for me because I put it up and really it's kind of like first come first serve. So the person who says sold gets the piece first and that always happens really fast and it's really fun to watch it. Um, and I kind of have been debating like that always has so much success with people kind of bidding first and saying that they want it. Um, I don't know how to transfer that same sort of um, hype over to being able to purchase it on the website. <laughs> I think part of it is part of it is just being able to say sold and know that you got it. I mean, it's a little bit of a competition. Um, but when I do do it, I, you know, I've thought about doing some Instagram stories with some of my artwork that I've had sitting around for a while just to kind of clear up space in the studio. And sometimes I think people just don't know it's there. Even though I've had things sitting in the Etsy shop for three months, sometimes I'll put it up on Instagram and somebody's like, ooh, is that available? <laughs> like, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's so funny to me that it's been sitting there in the shop for the last three to six months. But yeah, so, um, and then again, the administrative part of doing that, the sale every day, you know, it's not a ton, but you have to be very, I think as a creative person too, you have to be very careful about where all your energy goes. And so if you're spending two hours on Instagram, then that's two hours you can't be in the studio or two hours that you can't be working on the other administrative thing you need. So I, that's sort of my intent be behind trying to shift things over to the website too, because the website does everything. It, it takes addresses and it, yeah. you know, figures out the shipping and sends the invoice. Like there, I don't have to do all that part of it. So it saves me a lot of time. Um, but then I think you kind of lose that little competitive spirit about being able to claim the piece of artwork first. I hear you. Yeah. That is, that is an interesting balance back and forth. It, do you dedicate like a certain day, like speaking of like balance and scheduling, like do you dedicate a certain day to shipping a certain day to, you know, taking all your pictures for Instagram? Because I feel like you're creating and moving art so quickly that how are you like, how are you scheduling all of this or is it just natural? <laughs> Are you well, just I, a magical I, human being? <laughs> no. <laughs> I start with really great intentions and I make a little calendar for the year and um, it doesn't usually work the way I have intended. Um, but I'm, 
you know, no, I don't, ha I don't have any <laughs> consistent schedule. I wish I did. I wish I could say I had some kind of secret, but I, I really, I don't except the one thing is that I really am trying to make something every day. And even if it means, you know, I'm pretty protective about daylight hours and my oldest son is home right now and he is um, getting ready to move to Atlanta and he needs help picking out furniture for his house and I was like, or his apartment. And I was like, yes, we'll do that. I'm happy to do that with you, but only after daylight hours are done because that's my studio time. And he's like, are you sure you can't just help me now? I'm like, no, when it's dark out, I'll help you. And he's like, oh, okay. So <clears throat> I don't really know where I was going with that. I think just being protective of my time and, and making something every day and the shipping also, I, I think, I think I have rhythms, but I don't really know what they are. I, I probably couldn't, I can't tell you right now, but if I really looked at it and studied myself, I think probably Mondays I regroup kind of, and I'm like, okay, I see I have all these orders. So I'm gonna, I like to kind of have all of my to-dos cleared out before I can actually have a full creating um, session. So I think usually I would say Wednesdays, a lot of times I get a half day of creating. Thursday is like my big day of creating because by, you know, Monday, Tuesday, my half day, Wednesday, those are the times I've had to kind of get the, the packing and the shipping out of the way or whatever administrative stuff. Or if I, you know, now I'm going to start writing, you know, some simple blog posts to have there on the website. Um, but those will all come in the beginning of the week because to me, the treat, like the dessert of the week. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get really through all chunk. of it. Yes, yeah. I, that was always how I did my homework too, like the ugly stuff first, and then I can get to the fun stuff. That's so, I, so that's funny. probably it. Yeah. Those are, those are all like really good takeaways. I feel like it's, you know, it's interesting because you talk to some people and they have such a rigid schedule and it's like, oh, that's how you do it. Like that's how mm -hmm. success is, is, you know, brought to you. And then you hear other people who like are just a little more chill and they just, you have, it seems like you have structure, but it's just like very much in your head. And it's sort of like, you're doing you and you're feeling it out when, when you need to ship, when you need to do admin, when you you know, you're going to start working on your website and then just really protecting your time with creating at least every, a little bit every single day. So it's, it's very like insightful to hear like the different perspectives and how you, you can get there multiple different ways. Yeah, I would say I'm, I have definitely tried to push myself and try to be the super organized person and try to emulate other people who are such great goal setters and achievers and um, have these really high aspirations and they know exactly what they want to do and how much money they want to make. And, and I, it's, it is a fantastic plan, but I have literally made myself sick trying to accomplish that. So now I know, you know, I need to just listen to my bile it back now without overdoing it. Such good advice. It was so good talking to you. I feel like you were like a walking wealth of information. Oh, thank you. It was so nice to talk to you too. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode with Sarah. If you've gotten as much value as I have, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on Apple Music and Spotify. And if you're not already subscribed to the Ola Guapa newsletter, stop by the site, scroll down to the bottom of the homepage and submit your details. Each week you'll get shop updates, including new product drops and exclusive offers. Plus find out about new podcast episodes as they launch and much more. Adios Guapas.